Welcome and thank you for taking time out of your day to come and learn a little bit more about your rad bike and how to set it. We are coming out on Instagram Live, we're coming out on Facebook TV, and we're coming out on YouTube. For anybody who's viewing us on Instagram, if you'd like to switch over to YouTube or Facebook, if you have access, we may have multiple camera angles available, which we will not have available on Instagram. We're not going to kick off for one to two minutes, just going to give everyone a chance to roll in and jump on. We know it's 5.30, a lot of people coming back from work. I'm going to do a brief introduction to myself. My name is David Smith. I am the e-bike assembly supervisor in Seattle, Washington for the flagship store. So I'm very fortunate where I get to touch a large percentage of bikes from Rad Bikes. We're going to go through a brief overview today of all the parts needed in your drivetrain to propel your bike. We're going to go into a brief diagnostic of how to see if we're having any problems before we step over to a bicycle where we're going to go through the order of operations required to correctly set a derailleur hanger. So while we're waiting for everyone to join in, I'm going to give you a little brief description of myself, where I came from and how I got here. Originally, I was an enduro mountain bike racer. I, I raced out of Ireland for quite a few years. I hung up my SPDs around three years ago or so uh, before moving to the Pacific Northwest and starting my adventure with Rad Power Bikes, where I just get to play with some of the most amazing toys ever, every single day. One thing in our brief email, <clears throat> I did forget to include a three millimeter Allen key. So now would be the perfect time to go and have a look, grab that if you need to, but don't be afraid. This video is going to be available after the fact. So if you need to refer back to it, it's going to be there for you. So no worries there. If you're having any issues with sound, please let us know in the comments, adjust everything now, but I think we should be just getting ready to get started in a minute or so. So I'll give you an outline of what we're going to do. At the start, we're going to go through all of these components I have laid out, which make up a drivetrain of a bicycle. It's important for us to understand how they work and how they function before we get into a deep dive of setting a derailleur. Very luckily for me, a derailleur is one of my favorite parts on a bicycle and one of the best innovations, I believe, for a bicycle. They allow you to do so much more on every single bike. And as we go through some of the history of derailers, we'll throw in a couple of fun facts you can learn, and we can try and imagine what it was like before there were derailers, so everyone is a little bit more grateful every time they shift gears. So we're going to go into a basic start of the components first. The first thing we're going to look at today is a bicycle sprocket. When we're talking about sprockets for bicycles, it's generally a metal ring, which we have teeth, which are going to engage a chain and provide propulsion. So it's just a metal ring, lines of teeth, and we can see quite clearly that the chain links, it can hold, and this is now going to be what's in between your legs at the pedals when you rotate, and that's going to provide propulsion by pulling the rear wheel connected to the rear sprockets. So a single sprocket is a single ring with teeth, when we combine these sprockets, especially when they have different sizes, so a different number of teeth, this combination is what's going to make up a gear set, more commonly referred to in bicycles as a freewheel or a cassette. This is a cassette. Uh, some people may refer to different iterations as a freewheel. Ours have seven different teeth, which give you seven different gears. The number of teeth on each ring will determine how many rotations this needs to make before the wheel does a full rotation. The larger number of teeth, the easier it's going to be for your legs to pedal because the chain gets to travel so much longer before the wheel does a full revolution. The smaller gears, that's gonna be much harder on your legs, much higher gear for descending down hills where you really still want to push against the pedals. So we have a beautiful seven gear set up here, which gives us a great range for climbing the biggest hills in the center for commuting on flat cycle tracks and towards the smaller sprockets for descending down the biggest hills you're gonna come across. Now that we know what your cassette or freewheel is and what sprockets are, we need to look at how the sprockets at the rear and front are connected, which is a chain link. This is a very basic chain link, and this is how a chain would have appeared before a derailleur. It's a simple circle going from a rear sprocket to a front sprocket, giving you only one gear. 
A chain is the most underrated part of a bicycle, in my opinion. The average bicycle has 116 different links in its chain. When it's performing well, you will be oblivious <clears throat> to how it is running. Most people don't even think about it. But as soon as this starts to deteriorate in performance, it's going to be the first thing that gives you an oral cue that you're listening to. And it's going to be very annoying for the rider on the bike. So generally, we don't say thanks enough to the chain, but then as soon as it gives any problems, we're very, very aware. To help you understand what makes up a chain, we have actually dismantled a chain board here. So we can see all of the different pins, inner plates and outer plates, which is going to make this really super simple. So we can see how the chain is constructed. In front, we have a full chain link still connected. And here we have popped out the different pins outer plates, inner plates, and rollers. These are all friction fit together, meaning that each link on the chain can move up and down and still remaining quite supple, while still being taut enough that we can propel the bike by pulling the sprockets with this chain. Having good gear shifting and indexing is really important to prevent damaging this chain and pulling apart any of those plates, pins, washers. So we have to really index our gears correctly to ensure it's silent, to ensure it's safe, and to make sure that your ride is as enjoyable as possible. Everything we're going through here in a couple of minutes is gonna become very obvious when we go to this dismantled gear selection system, and we're gonna see how they all interact with each other. So don't worry if one or two of these little points are going over the top, we're gonna to go back and touch on them again. This is just a brief overview of all of our parts. The next part we're going to look at <clears throat> is a gear selector. We use an indexed gear selector, meaning that each gear has a number. It's here on an index window, which makes it very easy for you to realize what gear you're in. Gear number one is the easiest gear to pedal in. So just like if you're starting uh, driving a car, gear one is gonna be the easiest. And as you climb to a higher number, it generally means you're doing more speed. We have a plus indicator to indicate we're adding, going to a higher number, to a higher gear. And then we have a paddle which gets turned when we want to go to a lower gear. This is very precise. And when we pull a cable by one inch at the shifter, it gives you a direct two inch pull at the derailleur. That's gonna give you that adequate spacing between our sprockets when we go to index the bike later. We need to learn how this communicates with the rear derailleur. And that is done by using a gear cable. The gear cable treads through the gear selector, goes through its housing and down to the derailleur itself. The actual gear cable is quite supple. As you can see, it bends, it flexes. This is really about just providing the right amount of pull when we index. So we need to protect the gear cable. We need to try and keep it weatherproofed and we need to try and keep it from getting any kind of dirt damage, corrosion, buildup of dirt to ensure that it is moving fluidly through that cable housing. So next we're going to look at the cable housing, which this cable inserts. It'll just take me a minute to get this pushed through. So now we can see at this end, we clearly have the gear cable treaded through the gear housing. This is very unnatural to see it cut like this, but I have done this to expose all of the different parts of a cable housing for you. This is compressionless cable, which means that the housing does not change in length when we select our gears. That is important to keep the ratio of pull perfect for a really crisp, clean indexing. On the inside, just after the metal phrase, there's a plastic sleeve which is exposed. That is to provide friction-free movement of that cable in and out of the housing whenever we choose we want to move it. It should never move when we do not select. The last thing we're going to look at before we look at the whole derailleur system and gear selection system combined is the dropout hanger. This is the sacrificial part on a bicycle. It is a soft metal which connects the derailleur hanger to the main frame via the rear triangle. The reason this is a sacrificial part is if there's any pressure on the transmission itself, if a foreign object gets caught in the middle of the transmission while you are doing quite a high speed 
or a high amount of cadence or revolutions per minute, we could have a lot of damage to the bicycle frame or to the rear derailleur, which is quite a complicated unit. So we have this fault point between the frame and the derailleur that allows this to bend or break rather than damaging the frame or the derailleur. It's called a dropout hanger, a derailleur hanger, or some people, because of its function, refer to it as a frame saver. These can be made in many different ways by being cast, CNC'd, pressed, but it is a disposable part. It's gonna be important for us to know that because this is gonna be one of the first safety checks we do before we set our derailleur. Now, the fun begins, and we get to talk about the derailleur itself. The reason this is one of my favorite parts of a bicycle is because of the versatility it allows for the bike rider. Before a derailleur was invented, <clears throat> pre-1905, to change gears, a rider would have to get off his bike, take his toolkit out, remove his rear wheel, and then begin physically changing sprockets and putting different size sprockets on the bike. This would not have been a lot of fun and apparently annoyed a lot of riders at the time, which is what drove Paul de Vivi in 1905 to patent the first ever two gear derailleur selector. There's a lot of arguments in the bike community about how to pronounce the word as it is spelled derailleur, but it did come from a French technology already used in diverting runaway cable cars in train tracks, uh, and it was always referred to in the original patents as a derailleur. So that is what I refer to it as. It can also be called a rear mech. There are many different names, but the rear derailleur is what allows us to have multiple gear sets on the bike and change them fluidly from the gear selector on the handlebars. It wasn't until around 1945 or so that the rear derailleur actually came into use in the Tour de France and it was a game changer. The average times reduced by 30 to 40% because of the lack of mechanical work. You could have a better cadence so your legs were enjoying the ride much more. So now we're gonna go through a couple of the key components to a rear derailleur. If we look from the rear side, it's quite easy to see we have this long cage which connects the top and bottom jockey wheel. These are another set of sprockets. So it's just a ring with teeth that can engage with your chain. They both have two different jobs. The top jockey wheel or G jockey wheel for guide is used to guide the chain directly onto your cassette to make sure you have clean indexing. So that is known as the G jockey wheel for guidance. The bottom jockey wheel is commonly referred to as the tension jockey wheel. The reason this is called a tension jockey wheel is it's connected to a spring body, meaning when I articulate and let go, it springs back. The main job of the bottom jockey wheel as the tensioning wheel is to pull that chain tension back to keep the chain tight. This is what allows us to gain access to a big sprocket allowing for a long chain, but then when we go to a smaller sprocket and the chain is not as tight, the spring in the tension wheel pulls back holding that chain and giving good indexing, especially to our seven sprockets. The next thing we're going to look at is from the reverse of the upper body of the derailleur. We have two screws, the H and L limit screw. The easiest way to think about a H and L limit screw is like the banisters on a staircase. They're going to stop, travel too far to the right or left that could cause a danger for the chain to slip off. So just like walking up a staircase without a banister on either side, it's very unsafe, you could fall off. These are in charge of keeping our chain exactly between the sprockets. The H-limit screw prevents the chain moving into the bicycle frame from the lowest, smallest sprocket. The L-limit screw prevents the chain jumping off the biggest sprocket into the wheel, motor, or spokes on the rear wheel. So these are gonna be very important when we go to set these. The great news is once we set them, they should be permanent because of the fact that it is a metal screw into a plastic body, vibration doesn't affect these settings. So it's not something we have to do very often on a bicycle. The last adjustment screw that we're going to look at is the B limit screw or body angle screw. 
This really refers to the height of the top jockey wheel. We do not want this jockey wheel being too close to our biggest sprocket or they could come in contact and the chain will not run cleanly through the system. Luckily, the B-angle screw has the largest window of acceptability, so it does not have to be set quite as precise as the H and L limit screw. But don't worry, the H and L limit screw actually give us cues that will tell us if they're set correctly or not. So it's very easy to know if your H and L limit screws are connected correctly. The last part we're going to look at is the cable pinch bolt. The cable pinch bolt is located on the main body and this is what attaches the gear cable we discussed earlier and gives pull in between each of the actual sprockets. When setting the cable tension, it's going to be quite important to get it correct, but we don't want to have to reset it three or four times to get it really dialed in. So we've added this barrel adjuster. By screwing this counterclockwise or unscrewing the barrel adjuster, it's going to increase the cable tension. And by screwing it in, it's going to decrease the cable tension. This will become very obvious when we go to setting the gears on a bike, how we adjust this. Now that you have a basic understanding of all of the components that go into a drivetrain that we use for propelling a bike, we have mocked up a very small shifting system outside of a bike to show you everything needed. We've talked about our indexed gear selector. We've talked about the cable housing, which protects the cable from corrosion, weathering, and also sets the cable length. We have some exposed cable, which you're all going to see on the rear triangle of your bicycle. I have a clean white indicator here so that I can give a clear example of cable pull. So every time I index a gear, you're going to see that cable movement. That is exactly the distance between each sprocket on our cassette. So once we get the tension correct, it should shift through all seven gears quite fluidly. We can also see at the back our silver dropout hanger which sits between the rear triangle of the frame and the derailleur body itself. This is the fault point that's made to bend or break in the event of an accident or anything getting stuck in our transmission. So that is the basic of how a gear selector communicates with a rear derailleur and allows us access to all of the seven sprockets on our bike. Now that we have a good understanding of the theory, we're going to go through our toolkits. We're going to go through everything else needed before starting working on your bike. If you still have your toolkit provided with every rad bike sold, simply dive in, unzip, take out your Phillips screwdriver or cross-headed screwdriver. This is going to be very important for adjusting our H limit, L limit, and B limit screw. Take out your size five Allen key. This is going to be important for both checking the spacing on the B-limit screw. Because this is five millimeters thick, this is the perfect spacer for our five to six millimeter gap between our G pulley wheel, our top guide pulley wheel, and our biggest sprocket. And the last thing that we're going to use is your keys. So to get prepared to working on a bike, I love my wife very much, but when it comes to safety, safety is no accident. So if you're wearing any jewelry on your hands at all, please remove that now. We do not want that getting caught on a jockey wheel or a pulley. We can also put on some gloves to stop any contamination. And if you just bear with us two seconds, we're gonna change some camera angles and get set up to work on our bike. Now that we are gloved up, we're beside our bike, we have our bike steadied in our repair stand, so we're safe to work on the bike. There is two things to do to make sure that an electric bike is safe to work on. The first thing we're going to do is take our keys and turn off the battery. Now that our battery is off, we know that the bike cannot get any electricity from the battery, we're not going to kick on our very powerful motor. And we're not going to get a big jump and move our chain quite a lot. Our controllers have the ability to store a small amount of electricity. So to make sure that we don't have any here, I'm going to go up to my handlebars on the three button remote. 
I'm going to turn my bike on as I normally would. The display will flash for a quick second and then turn itself automatically off. That is going to discharge all of our battery, any electricity that's in our capacitors. So that's going to make the bike now safe to work on. We're not worried about any of the electrical components. First thing we're going to do is select gear number seven on our gear shifter. That should be our final sprocket. Make sure our gear selector is in the correct position. We are then going to disconnect the gear cable from the cable pinch bolt. The reason we're doing this first is to prevent the cable tension from giving us false results during the rest of our tests. So by doing this, it's going to make setting the H and L limit screw very easy to diagnose to make sure that we're getting everything correct the first time. Now that we have everything prepared, we need to visually inspect the rear dropout hanger. If this dropout hanger is not straight with the frame, there is nothing that we can do in our settings to counteract that. We would have to bring it to a RAD mechanic, call out the RAD mobile ambassadors to come to you and repair it on the spot, or bring your bike to a RAD certified mechanic to have that looked at. It's a very specialist piece of tooling that not a lot of any home mechanics have, so that is something we're gonna have to leave to a bike shop. It can be very hard with the naked eye to tell if this is bent or not. So during our testing rig, we have a good example to show you what a bent dropout hanger looks like. So when we look from the rear, you can see that the main body is bent. The derailleur hanger is angled inwards, and that's going to throw off all of our selection. Whereas on the bicycle here, we can see that the dropout hanger is straight. It's in line with the frame. It's setting us up for maximum success. So if you see a bent dropout hanger, that's something we're going to need a certified mechanic to work on. If your dropout hanger is straight, we're then ready to begin setting our limit screws. We're going to start with the high limit screw. The high limit screw, as we discussed earlier, is to prevent the gear chain shifting into the bike frame. So as I spin the chain set, you're going to you can actually hear that this is clicking. And if you look closely, you'll notice that we're not actually in our smallest sprocket, even though our gear cable is not connected. This instantly tells me that the H limit screw is over restricted. It's keeping the derailleur body too close to the wheel and not allowing enough pitch to come out and gain access to our last sprocket. So the first thing we're going to do is unrestrict the H limit screw. We unrestrict the H limit screw by screwing it counterclockwise, by dialing the screw out. It is a very fine adjustment. So every time we make this adjustment, we only want to do a quarter turn at a time. And what I'm looking for is to see that the chain gets access to the last sprocket and then runs quite silently and happily in there. So we're going to go to our H limit. We're going to spin a quarter twist at a turn and we're going to look and listen to our chain. So already I can hear a louder click like it wants to jump, but it hasn't got enough mobility yet. So I'm gonna do another quarter turn. It's getting louder and it's actually shifted across, but it's still running quite loud. So I'm gonna unrestrict it a little bit more. We're now getting a little bit better silent passage through. So it's important now to use our hand. So we're gonna use our first finger, our pointer and our thumb to articulate the derailleur, pushing it across a few gears and letting go to see if it can spring back into position. We want to do this two to three times just to make sure that limit is perfect. If we unrestricted it too much, when the chain jumps down from such a height, it will shift into the frame. So I'm now quite confident that our H limit screw is set correctly. After this, we can connect our shifting cable. This is one of the harder things to do perfectly the first time. Once you've done it four or five times, you're gonna get a really good feel for it. So in our testing rig, we could see that we had some cable exposed in the rear triangle. The way I'd normally describe this to mechanics when I'm teaching them how to set a derailleur is that we want it taut like a guitar string so that it can be plucked but you don't need to force it or really pull it too hard so we'll take our size 5 allen key and we're going to 
pinch the cable taut and tighten our cable pinch bolt. This does not have to be too tight. It's the exact specifications is about six Newton meters. We don't really need a, a torque wrench for this. We can set this by hand. We really just want the cable to be pinched so it can't release. We don't want to over tighten it to compress and break that cable. That's gonna avoid us from being able to, or stop us in future being able to further adjust this cable. So just pinch it enough that we are happy that it is secured. We can now look at indexing our gears and setting our L limit screw. So by articulating the derailleur across using our hand again, we can see where the L limit screw is. The L limit screw is meant to stop the chain in the last bracket and not allow it to shift over into the motor spokes or wheel. So as I articulate the derailleur, you can actually see that this has the opposite problem. The chain has now slipped between the motor and the sprockets. Right now, when the bicycle is in a repair stand, that is not a big deal. But if you are out on the road, this could be quite dangerous. This could allow the chain to catch the rear wheel, stopping it from rotating, putting you into a skid without any warning. So that's where the limit screws or the banisters on the stairs are so important to prevent that ever happening. So the first thing we're going to do, now that we know the L limit screw is under restricted, we we'll want to restrict it a little bit more. So we're gonna take our size two Phillips screwdriver, we're gonna find the L screw at the back of the derailleur, and we're going to turn it a quarter of a turn clockwise every time. As we push back, we can see the first quarter did not help, it's still over shifting. So we're gonna do it once more. It's now gaining access to gear number one or the largest sprocket. It is not over shifting and it's running quite silently. So just like the H limit screw, we want to test this two to three times just by pushing across, putting as much pressure as you can on the derailleur body and making sure that it cannot over shift. So now I am quite happy that the H limit screw is set. So one banister is set, we can't fall off this side. On the other side, the L limit screw is set and I can't fall off the other side. So that is our banisters set. The chain can't go too high and can't go too low. Now we need to worry about indexing and finding each one of these sprockets really clean and crisply to give you a smooth gear change and performance. So the first thing we're going to do, we already have the bike in gear number seven. We have the H limit screw set that's gonna stop that falling off. So we try to select gear number six. So up at the handlebars, I'm going to select gear six while pedaling so I don't damage my chain pins. You can hear that it wants to shift, but it's very slow to shift. So it made a noise like it was jumping. The G pulley wheel was trying to push it across and it just couldn't jump up. I need to increase the cable tension to allow it a little bit more pressure to pull up. So we go to our barrel adjuster and we're going to unscrew or spin it counterclockwise, just a quarter turn, to see if that makes that shift a little bit smoother. Already just with that quarter turn, it's sounding a lot more silent. I'm going to go back and select gear seven and transfer between seven and six to ensure that that is fluid. We're in seven, one index at the shifter, and we're in gear six. So now it's time to try five. Five is running smooth, but there's a little bit of noise. So this is where we can play with our barrel adjuster to make sure that the G pulley wheel is inboard enough if we go too far, it will shift into the next gear, but then it's very simple to actually just undial and come back. So just to show you, we have the correct gear selected. If I increase tension, I can do it enough to actually get it to skip and jump over a gear. So you can hear it now starting, and all of a sudden it has derailed. It's now in a new sprocket. So if it goes too far, just unrestricted till it jumps into the gear that you have selected. We're in the gear and now listen, make sure that it's silent. Perfect. 
because we have our cables pull set correctly now, we should be able to go back to our last gear, gear number seven, and we can go through the entire gear set to make sure that it is functioning correctly. So seven is good and silent. Six, very crisp, quick change. As soon as I index it to selector, within a millisecond, it's in the sprocket. So that's showing a really, really good sign of gear selection. Next gear, so we've gone seven, six, five. Five is good. Four is good. Three is good. Two is good. And we already know that one should be perfect from our L limit screw. This is all down to the gear cable pull. Shifting from a smaller sprocket to a larger sprocket, we're increasing the cable tension, allowing it to jump up. As we're coming down the sprockets to a different gear, this has all got to do with the cable ten or the tension pulley wheel. So this has really got to do with the spring in the derailleur. So now as we're coming back down, we're going to make sure we're able to fall into every gear correctly also. That seems to be performing quite well. So the last thing we're going to check now is our B limit screw or body angle screw. So this is going to be important to select gear number one, our largest sprocket. So first of all, select gear one, change our gears. And what we're really looking for is in between the top jockey wheel, so the G jockey wheel and the sprocket, we need a five to six millimeter gap. So I can take my size five Allen key and I can insert that between the sprocket of the cassette and the sprocket on the pulley wheel. So right now, performance is good, but we're sitting at about a nine millimeter gap. So I need to reduce that by three millimeters. We can take our size two Allen key. We can go to the B limit screw, which is presented at the top of the derailleur facing up. It's the most visible where you can see it's just pushing against the dropout hanger and I'm going to reduce the tension. So I'm going to screw it counterclockwise because it's three millimeters. I'm going to give it about two full turns. So you will see as you go clockwise, it's reducing the height counterclockwise, pulling back up the height. Now we can go back and check with our five, make sure that is working. Excellent. Our gap is now at six millimeters, well within our safety window. The B limit screw, as we said, is the least precise. So if you're not having any issues with your gear selection, there's no massive requirement to go and play with this one. But as we've made a small adjustment, it is quite important to go and check the indexing on all seven gears one more time. So I'm going to do that by coming the whole way down to gear number seven. Just like at the start, we're going to go one gear at a time. Six, five, four, three, two, and one, and do the same thing in reverse. Excellent. So when we came to this bike first, its B limit screw was spaced out too much. Its high limit screw was restricted too much that we weren't getting access to a gear. Its L limit screw was under limited, allowing dangerous movement into the rear wheel. And we have managed to, just in a couple of minutes, rectify all of those problems that we're confident that this gear system is set up perfectly now. When we're talking about shifting down the gears, one thing that could be an issue is cable. Either that it's degraded, it's got some dirt, it's got some debris, it's got some kinks, which is causing friction within the unit. So I'm going to take you back to the table where we can do some questions and answers, and I can also show you a damaged derailleur cable. This is my derailleur cable from my Rad Rover. I removed it three to four days ago to give us a good example of what a damaged cable looks like. On this end, we can see this is the cable that was protected by the cable housing. It looks very, very new. It's very smooth, still shiny. There's no damage to this cable at all. 
So I'm very confident that this can run friction free. But if we look at the exposed end of the cable, we have a lot of iron oxide or rust developing within the cable. We've got some kinks where it was bent before. We have some debris building up from dirt coming up from the road. And the big issue is this is now not friction free. I can't push this cable through. It should be very smooth. It should be easy like this end, but it is not. This means when you select the gear, there may be a delay between when you index on the gear shifter and the gear changing. So if you've set all of our H and L and our cable tension correctly, like we've just done, you're finding that you can get access to all seven gears, but it's quite slow when you index at the shifter. It's taking two to three seconds before it changes gear. That's normally an indication that you have some contamination in your cable and housing. It's very important to keep this friction free. And it's very important if you're replacing one because of contamination that you replace the other. If you just replace the gear cable and put a new cable through an old housing, the rust has already begun inside and it will not take very long for it to attach to the cable and cause friction. They're very inexpensive. It's a disposable part. So that is something that needs to be replaced if you're having issues with your gear selection after everything else is set correctly. So hopefully that will allow you to have a little bit more information about derailers. You feel a little bit more confident to work on your bike. We are going to open up for some questions and answers. So we're going to see if there's anything that I haven't touched on, anything more that you need to know. So I'm just going to grab my laptop real quick and hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions. Okay, so I can see one very good question already. Should I be afraid that the teeth on my freewheel are different shapes? Some of them look damaged, yet my bike is brand new. That is actually a great question, and that is something I probably should have brought up earlier. This is really good to notice, and this is something that happens quite a lot. So on single chain sprockets, all teeth are generally the same profile. On a, on a freewheel or cassette, all of your teeth all have an exact orientation with the other teeth. So when you are building a sprocket or a set of sprockets, they all have to go in an exact position. The reason being, and if you look at your own cassette or freewheel, you're going to see that there are quite a few teeth that have a different shape. Some will be angled up, some will be angled down, some will be clean and really defined. If you see a tooth that is clean and really well defined, that's gonna be used for really gripping the chain and giving propulsion when you push your chains down. So if you ever stand up when you're trying to climb a hill and you feel that pressure, that's you engaging with the chain. But when our G pulley wheel that we discussed earlier needs to pull across to a different sprocket, having angled teeth can help derail the chain to give real access to all of your seven gears. So if you're seeing some tooth profile differences, that's actually very, very normal. As long as your tooth profile is high and proud, that we know we are happy. The only time we would replace a cassette or a freewheel is if these teeth looked more like shark's teeth. They have quite a long valley in between and they're all very jagged. That generally means that the chain has stretched the pins and rollers have separated and they're starting to degrade either side of the actual tooth profile. But the fact that they all have different shapes, that is there to help the performance of the derailleur and the cassette working together. So very, very good question. That's really good. The next question is how often should I replace my gear cable and housing or how will I know when it needs to be replaced? Well, we touched briefly on how you know when it needs to be replaced. That is going to be when you're having friction in your gear shifter. Sometimes it can be as obvious as when you index with your thumb that you feel there's a lot of pressure against it before it will actually click and index into the next gear. Uh, other than that, if you are selecting uh, going from gear one up to a higher number and you find that it's slow in doing that, but when selecting from a higher number to a lower number, it's very easy to do that. That is a direct telltale sign 
that your gear, cable, and housing has some friction inside. Why, when I pedal on my, this is from, sorry, Mark from Instagram. Why, when I pedal on my Rad Mini aggressively, does it jump off the gear and slips? Mark, that, it could be one of two things. It could be that your indexing is not perfect and your derailleur is wanting to jump into another gear set. Uh, but more than likely, what that means is that your chain has stretched apart and it's finding it hard to actually index the teeth. So I have a chain ring here. I can push my chain around. This marries together beautifully. Um, so the profile of the teeth matches the length of the chain. These chain rollers over time will begin to degrade. So if you find that the gear is actually quite happy that it's finding the correct sprocket, but it's dry jumping where it can jump over a sprocket and back onto the same sprocket again, that normally means that your pins inside your chain have worn down so much and are giving lateral movement that it's actually able to jump off the two profile and land back on the same sprocket again. So I would recommend Mark bring, try out everything we did today. If that doesn't increase your performance, I would bring the bike down to a bike shop. They will have a very, very simple chain stretch checker. So 0.6 of a single percent in chain stretch warrants replacing a chain. So 12 links in a chain should be 12 centimeters. If you have only 0.6 of a percent, so not even a full percent of stretch, you are now starting to damage the teeth on your actual sprockets. From the sounds of what Mark is saying, if it is truly indexing correctly, but jumping over the sprocket, it sounds like Mark may have already damaged his tooth profile that they're not marrying happily together. So it may be a new set of sprockets and a chain for Mark in that instance, if setting his gears again does not improve his performance. If you do have any other questions with that, you can also reach out to Rad Power Bikes product support. They will be really, really helpful in sending you some links to some good videos like this Rad Academy and also in other troubleshooting uh, information that we have. So touching gaze, but product support would really be a perfect one if you're having further issues after this, Mark. Fast Eddie, what a handle, that's amazing. Uh, Fast Eddie from YouTube, should I lube my cable? How and with what? That is a really good question as well. Uh, so lubricating cables is a double-edged sword. By adding a lubricant, you are reducing the friction, which should provide you with faster gear selection and also, because lubricants have a fat base, they are hydrophobic, so they don't like water, and they're not going to allow it to get in and rust that cable fast. But that comes with a caveat. If you're using a very viscous or thick uh, lubricant, it can actually clog the lines. It can attract dirt and debris and dry powders, which would normally just evaporate off or fall off the cable, can actually build up faster. So yes, Fast Eddie, I do lubricate my cables, but I only lubricate a new cable as I'm putting it into a new housing the first time I install it, and I use a dry lubricant. Dry lubricant is the thinnest viscosity lubricant you can have so that it is adding to that friction-free pull. So when we pull or release, the cable can go through effortlessly, but you're not getting the negative results of actually compromising your cable when you're trying to do it a good service. So great question, Fast Eddie. Yes, lubricated, use a tin lubricant. Linda from Facebook, how do you clean and maintain a derailleur and how often? How often is always a very interesting question when it comes to bikes because it could also be seen as how long is a piece of string. There's no definitive answer, but it does depend on your bike, where you park it, your riding style, all of those factors come into play. So if you ride your bike only in perfect weather on the nicest days and it gets stored in a temperature controlled environment, then there mightn't be a very big need to lubricate it very often. For myself, I ride my bike pretty much every single day. 
I, I love it, use it, and abuse it. So it takes a little bit of maintenance every now and again. What I find the best thing to do with a derailleur is, um, and again, there is some other knowledge we need to know. On all of our bikes, we apply a disc brake. It is very, very important that we do not contaminate or lubricate the disc brake at any time. Any lubricant on a friction-based brake will really hamper your brake performance and the safety of the bicycle itself. So when cleaning a derailleur, I will generally use an aerosolized lubricant, so a spray can. The reason being, this is one of the thinnest lubricants you can have that is forced or propelled at high velocity. So if I turn the derailleur around and articulate, you will see inside there is a main spring body that runs the length. That's what gives that tension pulley wheel its tension when it pulls back. There's also three different pivot points where these slide, the upper derailleur articulates as well. So I would normally wrap the backside of my derailleur with a towel to prevent any overspray going onto my rim, my tires, my brakes. And I would then use a tin nozzle attachment for a spray can of WD-40 or whatever lubricant that you use. I would use that to jet in high velocity uh, lubricant forcing any contaminants and debris out while always keeping the derailleur lubricated. A lot of people look at using degreasers and stuff like that. I was never taught to do that because if you use a degreaser and it's too harsh and you don't lubricate it well enough afterwards, you're asking for your rear derailleur to seize up. So very good question. Spray a lubricant, make sure nothing else gets contaminated and then wipe it all down afterwards so we don't have any ac excess that's going to build up any powders, debris, or anything like that. I'm just gonna have a quick look through and see if I can find a few good questions to answer for you guys. Just bear with me one second. As I said, this is going out live. So there's one question, can I access this later? The video uh, seems to be having some issues with their local internet or Wi-Fi. Yes, this will be posted on Instagram Live, uh, so IGTV, it's gonna be on YouTube, it's gonna be on Facebook later. So you're gonna be able to get this after the fact. So don't worry if you're gonna be working on this later, you can always find our handles at Rad Power Bikes on all of our different platforms. This video will be available. So if you're gonna work on your bike in a week or two, you're gonna replace your cable and try and touch everything up, don't worry, you will have access to this. And also if you know other cyclists, other rad owners, please feel free to share this with them. The more you can understand about your bike, the less you're gonna to have to pay to maintain it. The more you're gonna know when there's a safety critical problem, the more enjoyable the bike is gonna be for you and the less it's gonna to have to spend with a mechanic or with our rad mobile team. So really, we're just trying to give you the information to keep your bike running as perfect as possible all of the time. So yes, this will be available after. An Instagram live question, uh, I am getting a lot of noise when pedaling backwards. Yes, pedaling backwards is not advised at all. You're always going to hear a noise. Some of that has got to do with what we discussed when we were talking about the teeth profile. Because some of the teeth are angled and shaped to derail the chain, a bike is not designed for you to pedal backwards. So if you pedal backwards, you will generally hear not only the bearings inside from the free wheel spinning, you're also putting pressure on the inner poles you're putting pressure on the chain and the derailleur. So I would say at any stage, never backpedal more than a quarter or half turn. The only time I would ever backpedal is if I don't want to add propulsion, but I need to clear my pedal to make sure I don't strike a curb or a small obstacle or debris or road furniture. So when backpedaling, only do it to avoid obstacles when you don't want to add speed. Never just coast down backpedaling. I know it feels good and you feel very free when you're doing it, especially coasting at high speeds, but not how the bike was designed. So if you want to remove that noise, easiest thing to do is stop pedaling backwards. What bike stand is strong enough to hold a Rad Rover V5 from Scotty on YouTube, or Scott, apologies. 
uh, any reputable bike stand. So today I'm using a mobile portable park tool bike stand. I myself ride the Rad Rover V4, so I'm not as fancy. I don't have the newest version like you do, but it is something I work on quite a lot at home as well. The main thing I look for when I'm looking at a good repair stand, especially for at home, is reasonably priced. I want a pretty large footprint because I want to be able to distribute that load. Sometimes if you're doing bottom bracket removal, chain set, anything like that, some of the bigger work, you need to provide quite a lot of torque you're breaking something that's been torqued to 45 and 60 Newton meters. So I want something that's quite stable. And the last thing I will look for is good adjustability. You want the bike to be at an ergonomic position. So you don't want it too high. You don't want it too low. You need to be able to tilt and adjust to get clear line of sight on your sprockets and your brakes. So generally anything from any of the manufacturers like Pedro's Park Tool, anything like that, but look at stability, good wide footprint, good metal toggles, and at least three points of adjustability in height, in pitch and angle of the bike, and even in length of the arm. That's just gonna make it the most efficient for you. If you can get one with a little tool tray that's clipped on, even better just for having your tools right there when you need them. And oftentimes it can be a stretch holding on a fork while you're trying to screw everything on. So having everything efficient right there where you need it is really important. Oh, okay, Jolan from YouTube. I had to replace my back wheel on my Rad City. Now the gears are not shifting correctly. Is this normal? Yes, and I'm really glad you brought this up because this could be a safety concern. If your gears were working perfectly beforehand and it's the same wheel you put back in after a puncture, repair, or anything like this, one of two things could have happened. You could have bent your dropout hanger reinstalling the wheel so whenever we're working on one of our bikes, I would always rotate the bike upside down, protecting the display from the handlebars. So it's sitting on the handlebars and the saddle. We will then remove the wheel so that when we're reinstalling it, it gives you the least chance of bending your dropout hanger. So the first thing I would do is look from the rear of your bike and check is your dropout hanger straight. The next thing is your bike, may, or your rear wheel may not be seated fully. So if it's not pushed inside the frame enough, it could be at a slight angle. So that should be a huge safety concern as well. So uh, Jolan, I would use my 18. I would open the axle nuts. I would lean down on the wheel while tightening it back again and see does that increase performance. Check your dropout hanger for alignment. But I would really recommend calling out the Rad Mobile Service Division or bringing it to a Rad certified shop to have that looked at. Generally, for something very small like that, there may be not even a charge. It may be a two-minute job that they will just straighten your wheel up and it'll be perfect afterwards. So that's a really, really big safety concern and very well diagnosed from knowing your gears were working beforehand. Then the reinstallation of the wheel was what caused the issue afterwards. Bike Pam Springs on Instagram. What's your best advice on finding a reputable mechanic uh, does uh, Rad have a bike shop or bike school? Yes, the Rad Academy is one of our bike schools that we are developing at the minute. If there's other course content that you would find really good, please add it to the comments, email info at Rad Power Bikes, and tag anything that you would like to learn about with your bike. Generally, I would contact product support is the first thing. We are building up a network of certified bike shops all over the country who are well educated on our bikes. That's going to be a really good thing to do. See if there is a reputable bike shop that we've worked with in the past in your area. So that's going to be a perfect one. Reviews and word of mouth is going to be another one that's really great. So if you see someone that has or a bike shop that has a thousand plus and a four point seven star average, you know they're going to be pretty solid and they're going to be really tuned into what they're doing. Another Jolan from YouTube, should I take it to a bike shop or try this myself? I would definitely say try it yourself. Worst comes to worst, if you can't get it selected perfect, revert back to going to the bike shop anyway. But I think it is really, really important for you to get to know this. I think you have this really good tool that is this Rad Academy at your disposal. Play it back, pause, go through each step but we really have set an order of operations that should maximize your chances of success. So I believe in you. I think you'll be able to do it. 
get your toolkit out, have a try. And if not, you always know you have that bike shop as your safety net. So that's absolutely perfect. Okay, so I think that's about time to wrap up the Q&A. Don't forget, as we said, this is going to be posted on Facebook. This is going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on Instagram Live. So you can always watch it after the fact, share it with your friends, family, other bike owners. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like it, follow us, subscribe. As I said, our handle is at Rad Power Bikes on all channels. I'm David Smith. This has been an absolute pleasure. Until the next time, stay riding rad. And for bike mechanics, this is our version of a mic drop. Have a great night.